Uh, Rohingya facing the final stages of genocide. Does it mean there is no future for this minority? I think for over four decades now, the Rohingya have faced uh, all sorts of oppression. Um, of course, it's been escalating recently. Now, genocide we mustn't only think of as these episodic uh, examples of violence that we've seen after August the 25th. We must also conceive of it as what happens to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Apart from losing their rights, apart from losing their citizenship, we can see the other ways that they've been, this, this entire community have been strangled. Uh, there are barriers to them registering births, there are barriers to them marrying, there's arbitrary uh, confiscation of property, there is forced labour. Um, they have been, since 2012, they have been herded into these IDP camps, these concentration camps. In these concentration camps, access to medicine is very difficult. They are prevented from education, they can't take up certain occupations, they are not able to go into the army. So you see a whole array of measures, what Amnesty International calls apartheid measures. So in this institutional mix, you have all the instruments to prevent these people from, if you like, reproducing, from living peacefully, from carrying out their lives, their day-to-day their -day lives. It, there are restrictions in all uh, spheres of life. And of course, then you have these episodic uh, cases of when they're, they're being cleared. Remember, these refugees have been refugees before. There's been this cycle of violence, making refugees, repatriation, then making them refugees again. So, in order to answer your question, it's been bleak for over four decades, and I don't see any resolution of that bleakness. Most Rohingya and other Muslims in Rakhine state live without any form of identification. What does it mean and what consequences it could have? Well, this is the thing. Um, in the most recent uh, uh, violence, August the 25th, preceding this violence, they were insisting that Rohingya take national verification cards. Without going into it, it's a kind of... Uh, it, it, they promise a citizenship of a sort, but this is really a card which establishes someone as a Bangladeshi. In fact, some of the Rohingya have been telling us, when you fill out the form for the national verification cards, it's already pre-filled for you how you came to Burma. Even though they may have never have left Burma, they were born in Burma, their ancestors were Burma for hundreds of years, but it's pre-filled that you came from Bangladesh, even how you came, on an ox cart and so on. So that's the measure of, uh, you know, absurdity it is. And of course, without these passes, um, there's all sorts of uh, mechanisms of extortion. If you don't have an NVC card, you can't go from one town to another. If you want to go from one town to another, you have to pay the army guy at the check post some money. So it results in not only disenfranchisement, but also a mechanism for extorting money and a mechanism for targeting individuals and of course the wholesale dispossession of, of these people. What do you think are the reasons uh, San Suu Kyi failed to, to defend uh, the Rohingya? As I've said, I think um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi should not be seen as the great heroine, uh, should, should be seen as complicit in the commission of, uh, of genocide. Um, she has failed, completely failed to condemn what's been going on in Rakhine State. And since it all erupted, uh, there have been no uh, attempts to uh, allow foreign media to go unrestricted into these areas or even humanitarian organizations. Even after September the 5th, which was 10 days or so after the start of the clearance operations, she was lying, she was lying barefaced to the world that our operations have stopped when house burnings were continuing when all these hundreds of thousands of refugees were still pouring in because of the violence that was happening. 
I think you have to see also her reaction to criticisms by foreign statesmen like the congressman uh, from, the, from, from the United States because he raised the issue of two Reuters journalists having been arrested for, you know, uh, for, for carrying out their, for their job in Rakhine State. She flew off the handle. Apparently she was even about, so angry she was about to hit him. So you can see from these anecdotes, from these, uh, you know, her, uh, her actual statements that she is fully hand in glove with the military in the, uh, in the commission of genocide. How much power does she really has? Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, of course, the, the Burmese military, they have immense power. But she controls the foreign ministry, she, con uh, she is the state councillor, she controls two other ministries. So you would think that she has power. You would think she would be at least be able to condemn the violence. You would think that she would at least be able to exert some control over what's going on. And as someone said, um, in the absence, you know, if power means that you preside over this kind of genocide, what is the use of having that power? If you were given a Nobel Prize because you are um, a symbol of the struggle against oppression, then how can you sit back and not say anything? Do you think there was a real threat of separation of the Rakhine and building an independent state, Pakistan? This is completely absurd. Um, since uh, the military takeover in Myanmar, there was no possibility of any kind of uh, independence Arakan state. I grant you that originally in the chaos of, uh, of, of British partition 47, uh, there, were some, uh, there were some movements who wanted some kind of autonomy for that region. But that's, that's in, 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 uh, uh, that's in the, uh, it, it's decades, of, uh, decades ago and it's not really relevant to the current situation. The features that characterize the current situation are quite clear. The Rohingya have been dispossessed, the Rohingya have had their citizenship revoked, they are unwanted, they are considered illegal immigrants, they are considered um, terrorists. So the possibility that the Rohingya are in, a, uh, are, uh, are in a shape to do anything, they have a civil society to construct a, an independent state is just to me is a, is a completely far-fetched and absurd idea. I had no intention to make a film uh, about uh, raped women. When I first went in December of 2016, I encountered uh, some people and what they were telling me convinced me that I must do something. So in January of 2017, I was interviewing a woman called Roshida. She was telling me how her husband had been shot and how her 12-year-old was slaughtered in front of her. She was standing in front of a hut and, uh, and someone came from, outside, uh, from inside the hut and said, look, after you finish, could you please come in? Uh, and I did. After I finished interviewing Roshida, I went inside the hut. And there were about 20 women there, uh, young women ranging from the age of 14 to 17. Um, the woman who invited me in asked everyone, tell them how many of you have been raped. Uh, about three hands went up. She repeated the question. She said, tell him, he's a journalist, tell him how many of you have been raped. At that point, they all stood up. Um, my fixer and I were in there. Uh, we were staggered. Uh, we, were, we really didn't know what to make of the situation. It was, a, it was a difficult moment, as you can appreciate. And what happened then was even more remarkable. Um, the women came forward, they wanted to speak to us, they wanted to tell us of their experiences. And one girl in particular, 17-year-old Tasmina, she removed her veil, indicating that she didn't want her to be veiled. She wanted to speak on camera. She said she'd lost her dignity in Burma. Why now should she be veiled when she's um, uh, about to confront her accusers? And what she described was horrendous. She described the killing of her parents. She described um, um, the killing of her siblings. And she was gang raped. Um, at one point, uh, my, I turned around to my translator and I, I 
you know, he had stopped translating. And I could see that he had choked up with emotion. So it was a very, very difficult moment for us. And, you know, after I came back to the UK and I was reviewing the film, uh, I myself was, uh, I was very affected. I, in fact, had to speak to a clinical psychologist for two reasons. One, I didn't want to be traumatized myself by hearing all these stories of trauma. And secondly, because I had decided to follow these women and follow up with questions to these women over the next few months, I didn't want to traumatize them with my questions. What do you think are the main reasons for this long-lasting hatred? Well, um, I think it, race and religion in Burma have taken on a very potent and very powerful mix. And what the Rohingya represent to the, uh, uh, to the Burmese is that they're not Burman and they're, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, uh, they're not uh, Buddhist. Um, and they've decided that in order to uh, make sure that they, I mean, there's even, I think even Su Chi has said um, that the, uh, the Buddhists are worried about the global domination of Islam. So I think there really is this tremendous kind of usage of, of, of this potent mix of race and, uh, and religion in order to um, disenfranchise uh, the Rohingya. Do you think uh, there is a real threat of migration from Bangladesh to Rakhine state and this is what they're afraid of? That's what they claim. And that most of these Rohingya are illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, that these Rohingya are really not from uh, Rakhine state. Rohingya can trace their history back hundreds of years. Certainly the border has been porous and certainly there has been migration. But I can tell you of all the people that we have spoken to, and over the course of 13 months I've speaking, spoken to many, many Rohingya, None of them have any relatives in Bangladesh. None of them have come to Bangladesh, apart from as refugees in previous years. They don't have any connections to Bangladesh whatsoever. Um, and what, they are, uh, what they find completely absurd is that they are be being accused of being immigrants. They are being accused of being illegal immigrants when the very Rakhine that they live side by side with were uh, relocated, resettled in these areas in Rakhine state after 1955. So they're saying, we are somehow the illegal immigrants? Well, they came in 1955 when we had already been there and our uh, fathers were there and our grandfathers were there. So this is the remarkable absurdity of it all. Do you think Sun Tzu Chi is in charge for not letting journalists and filmmakers and NGO work in Rakhine? It's one of, the, one of the things that gives it away that San, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is really not serious about resolving this situation. This brazenness with which they, say they have prevented the uh, humanitarian organizations from accessing um, people, people who are desperately in need of humanitarian aid and the brazenness with which they have rejected independent media, foreign media, to go into this, uh, uh, this area of, 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 of crisis. I think that is the best indicator that Aung San Suu Kyi is working hand in hand with the military.